there are right, with such a heavy econometric analysis of standard variations and Gini coefficients, etc., etc., the post lens session could be slightly heavy. So we can have a slightly uh, lighter version of intellectual discussions with innovations in government, ideas for Bihar. And coming right after the question of inequality and Thomas Pictet's return on growth, capital, etc., a more fundamental questions in the context of Bihar and India with a population density of 1,106 persons per square kilometer, a question of distribution, redistribution, or acquisition of assets from private citizens have got the highest importance in development economic from a practitioner's point of view. So I would introduce Parichit Ghosh for land acquisition, balancing development and justice. So when Shaibal Gupta Sahib, our mentor here, in the administration side, he is our think tank, wanted me to chair this session a balancing development and justice. So I was wondering, should development and justice be on the two scales of the balance? Or they should be on the same side of the balance? Who is development and who is justice? Is the private development and public justice? Or is it public development and private justice? With these opening questions, I will introduce Parichit Ghos, who is an associate professor at Delhi School of Economics. He has received his PhD in economics from Boston University and has taught at Texas A&M University, University of British Columbia, and the Indian Statistical Institute. Ghos' research focuses on game theory and information economics. He has written about contemporary policy issues in various Indian newspapers, including Hindustan Times, Economic Times, and Anand Bajar Patrika. Parichit Ghosh, you go. Thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, thank you very much to IGC Bihar, uh, especially Professor Arjun Mukherjee, for uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, present this. Uh, this is based on uh, work which uh, or thoughts which I've been mulling over with uh, Moitrish Khotok, who uh, my partner in crime, who's in the uh, in the audience, and he has very generously agreed to take the tough questions. Uh, so I'll take the easy ones. Um, so this is the title: uh, Land Acquisition, Balancing Development and Justice. Um, so let me sort of start with. Okay, b before I get there, let me just give you a very briefly where I'm going. Uh, the name of this session is, is Innovations in, in uh, Growth, so, so it's uh, trying to come up with uh, new solutions to uh, nagging problems. So that's the spirit in which uh, I'll, I'll pitch this uh, talk. Uh, we have a particular kind of proposal about how to tackle this problem of land acquisition, which as you know has, has been a major problem in the last uh, 10 years or so and has uh, cropped up in, in all parts of the country under all kinds of political regimes. So it would be a little naive to think that you know, uh, the problem isn't deep-rooted. So, so we have an auction-based sort of uh, mechanism to, to propose, or at least the outline of a mechanism, of course nothing uh, completely fesh, fleshed out, which we think uh, will work better uh, compared to, to current approaches uh, which are reflected in the le recent legislation. And I'll try to convince you that you know, it's, it's a, a, a line of thinking that may be worth taking seriously. Um, uh, let me start with some general background to, to, uh, and, and to sort of uh, situate this problem of land acquisition in a, in a larger context of development. Uh, the theme of this conference is, is inclusive growth. The way I see it, there are two very distinct uh, senses in which we can uh, try to formulate inclusive growth strategies. The first one is uh, there are lots of pre-existing inequalities in a country like India, uh, which we know both from empiricism, empirical work, as well as theory, uh, could erect barriers to, to 
development for people at uh, towards the bottom end of the income distribution. Uh, in many countries, uh, empirical studies about intergenerational persistence. So, if you're born into a poor household, what are the prob what are the pro what's the probability that you could make it to the middle class or or even the rich? Uh, the the numbers which are estimated for most countries is is quite uh, depressing, even for the U.S. Uh, conceptually, we also know that if uh, uh, somebody is born into very poor families, which is extremely impoverished in terms of uh, human capital, uh, in terms of uh, availability, uh, you know, access to credit. That can create a sort of a vicious cycle, uh, which might keep generation after generation uh, trapped in poverty, even though the country, uh, at, a, at a broader level, uh, opens up to new opportunities. Uh, so those are pre-existing inequalities. So part of our attempts at, at uh, achieving in, uh, inclusive growth has to be about how to, how to uh, tackle these pre-existing inequalities uh, and so on. Uh, the second aspect which I want to emphasize and which I think has uh, more to do with uh, the issue of land acquisition is that inequality, uh, uh, the growth process itself uh, tends to generate inequalities of its own. Uh, there's this view of growth that, you know, which is captured in this uh, aphorism that a rising tide uh, lifts all boats. Uh, that seems to be uh, a, a naive uh, kind of view. Uh, growth often takes the form of uh, what Schumpeter called uh, creative destruction, right? It's, it's sort of uh, a demolition of old uh, production processes and uh, replacing them by new ones. Uh, one uh, leading feature of that, which is uh, which is uh, visible in the experience of all the sort of richer nations in the world today, is that their development uh, accompanied a big sectoral transformation from agriculture to manufacturing and then later to, to uh, services. Um, so the general point here is that uh, anything which increases uh, productivity often uh, is uh, 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 requires uh, massive changes, and these changes uh, create winners or losers, or tend to create winners and losers. Uh, so we can have the pie increasing in size, but uh, many people are left, could be left with smaller and smaller uh, portions. Uh, so uh, some of the examples, you know, FDI in retail, for example, if we, if we uh, uh, allow our retail sector to be modernized, then that uh, surely I mean, ultimately, to, uh, raising labor productivity is, is very much uh, necessary for development. But as we know, um, you know, a big part of uh, the Indian labor force is uh, engaged in informal retail, small-scale retail, and uh, that kind of skill or human capital cannot easily be shifted to factories or, or whatever production processes replace them. So, so there's a question of uh, obsolescence and so on, and, and some sections of the population may uh, really suffer falls in income and livelihood. Um, so I, I view this, uh, the, the, you know, I would like to sort of situate this uh, debate about land acquisition in sort of the second perspective that uh, development requires this structural transformation. But of course, in the process, many people may lose their assets or not enough, get enough value for them, and that is a source of uh, conflict and even injustice. Um, however, having said that, uh, I also want to emphasize uh, that uh, perhaps our thinking is influenced a little bit too much by a sort of zero-sum mindset on the question of land acquisition. Uh, there it tends to be a perception uh, that uh, it is a farmer versus industry conflict uh, or a conflict of a shrinking uh, agricultural sector and an expanding modern manufacturing or, or uh, uh, urban sector, uh, which it is, of course, to some extent, but that's not all there is to it. Uh, just to illustrate what I mean, uh, you know, if you take the case of the famous case of Singur in, in West Bengal, which I'm sure uh, most of this audience is, is familiar with, this is where the, the, the Tata group of companies, they wanted to build uh, this car factory in Singur in West Bengal, and eventually uh, land was taken, the factory was built, but there's no production because of the disturbances, they have now moved to Anand in Gujarat. 
So if you look at that and if you drive past that, you know, that factory, it's a, it's a uh, testimony to a situation which is uh, lose lose all around. Uh, about a thousand acres of farmland has been taken away, and there's no agricultural production going on there. Uh, and uh, investment worth about 1,500 crores has been flushed down the toilet. Uh, Tatars haven't got any returns either. So if you look at that example, it's difficult to argue that you know, we are, we are uh, sort of fighting about where to be on some Pareto frontier. We are deep inside the Pareto frontier. Uh, there, there were no winners in the Singur conflict. So one, one way to, I mean, there are two things to, to sort of highlight in the debate about land acquisition, which is how to balance the interests of these different groups, farmers versus uh, industrialists. But uh, the other, which requires, I think, a little more emphasis, is how to avoid these kinds of disasters, these kind of lose-lose outcomes. Uh, and in some sense, I would like to direct you in that direction in terms of looking at what I have to say. Uh, the debate often has become a proxy for bigger ideological or partisan wars, as you, I think everybody will agree, the political parties in general, when they are in opposition, they, they cry for justice and they root for the underdog and they say that, you know, these people, the farmers, they've, they've been displaced and so on and so forth. The moment they come to power, uh, they, they, their uh, tune or the approach changes. Um, uh, so, so that's uh, that's one thing, and the other thing is that you know it's it's sort of uh, somehow the land acquisition issue has been linked up to much broader notions of what development should should constitute uh, should be about. So, uh, the last general point I'll, I'll make before I move on to the to the details is that maybe it it may be productive to also reframe the debate a little bit and narrow it down to some extent. Uh, Keynes said that economists should be like dentists. Problems should be treated, specific isolated problems need requiring solutions. That's perhaps too technocratic a view. Um, some people, some of the previous speakers have, have said uh, how, uh, you know, ideology is, is artificially removed and like uh, inequality measurement, for example, how sort of the mathematics uh, often conceals uh, implicit ideological assumptions, um, but for cer certain purposes, it may be uh, you know uh, we we may need to tone down the ideology a, a little bit and uh, focus a little more at the technocratic aspect of the problem. And both are important. Um, here's one picture which I think kind of brings out the paradox, if you will. Uh, the left picture, this, these are both from Singur, the left picture is uh, people demonstrating, uh, asking Tata to leave the area. The other is another set of people demonstrating and saying that uh, uh, let Tata come back and generate jobs for us. So, so it's, uh, it's tough either way, it's not a simple choice. Um, let me quickly review a couple of things. Uh, why do we need, if at all, do we need eminent domain? Eminent domain is the notion that you know state should have some some sort of power to force people to to sell their land for various uh, projects. Um, various things have been said. Uh, one one point which is often made why some some degree of uh, eminent domain may be needed is the so-called hold-up problem, that if a company or any authority has to acquire land from, let's say, a thousand different parties, the last few who, people who sort of are the last few ones to sell can extract a high price and expecting that, you know, the, the acquisition authority may not embark on the acquisition in the first place. Uh, there is a hold-up problem, but I think in India, the sheer numbers are staggering and the weight of sheer numbers can often uh, sort of destroy a project which has to span a large area. Uh, from what I've read, although the numbers are sometimes conflicting, in Singur there were 12,000 landowners, and, and maybe Moitish can correct me if, if I'm quoting that number wrong, but thousands in, in, the, in the region of thousands. Now, if a private party has to make uh, contracts with 12,000 different owners of land, then surely something has, will go wrong somewhere, especially where the legal system is slow and riddled with all kinds of holes. You know, uh, so if you think 
there's a 1% chance of any single bilateral transaction to develop some sort of legal dispute or problem, then uh, when you're buying land from 12,000 owners, there's more than a 99% chance that you know, something will go wrong somewhere. So th this is why I think uh, some amount of uh, eminent domain powers may be necessary if we want to uh, create a reasonably uh, feasible process of industrialization. Uh, let me uh, quickly again summarize uh, what the law was, what were the essential features, and what the recent legislative activity has, has been about. So uh, there's a, this, uh, till recently, the Land Acquisition Act of 1894, passed by the British, was the sort of guiding legal frame framework. And uh, the main sort of feature of that was the compensation was to be paid to, to people whose land is taken was to be set equal to market price, let's say over the last three years, as determined by the collector. Uh, what the Land Acquisition Act of 2013 passed by the UPA, uh, the, change, the critical changes were that the market price now has to be a mark, uh, the compensation has to be a mark, to mark up over market price, uh, two in urban areas, four in rural areas. Uh, there has to be some additional money given to all the affected families in terms of an uh, R&R package. Uh, in the case of private industries, uh, for example, if GMR is building an airport, uh, then uh, there's a consent requirement. 80% uh, uh, of the affected families have to agree. And there's a social impact assessment to be done by some uh, board of experts set up. Um, the, there, uh, there's been a lot of uh, hue and cry and a lot of heat generated over the proposed amendments of the uh, new government. Uh, what the new government wants to do is to drop the last two of these items, right? The consent requirement and the social impact assessment. So this is now caught, uh, uh, as you know, in a parliamentary uh, logjam. Uh, so this uh, 2013 Act, basically, what it did uh, is it combined three approaches to uh, solving the problem of land acquisition and min minimizing uh, discontent and, and uh, protests. Uh, they, it, it tries to let money speak by increasing compensation amounts. It, uh, in some cases, only when private companies are involved, it like, tries to let farmers speak by uh, putting in this vote, 80% consent. It also uh, tries to let bureaucrats and civil society speak through this kind of social impact uh, assessment. So w one question to ask is, is why this seems a little bit like a kitchen sink approach that you uh, take everything we can think of and throw at the problem and maybe the combined weight of that will make it go away. Uh, so it raises a number of different issues or, or sort of puzzles if you look at this legislation. And the main point which at least stands out for us is where did these numbers come from? Why, why does the past market price have to be uh, quadrupled or doubled? Why not some other multiplication factor? Actually, if you look at the initial draft which came out of the National Advisory Council, they were suggesting that uh, in urban areas multiplied by three, rural areas multiplied by six, then of course the industry lobbies moved in and then they whittled down uh, that, that factor. But uh, we haven't seen any sort of uh, reasoning why uh, precisely these uh, factors ought to be applied uh, to determine compensation. So, uh, so before I get to our uh, sort of auction proposal, let me do a quick diagnosis of what we think was wrong with the 19th Century Act, but also with the sort of attempts to, to rectify it. Uh, historical market prices compensation at first glance or first blush doesn't seem too unreasonable. But if you think about you know, what is involved, I think I can persuade you that it is really not a right uh, guide or benchmark for compensation. Uh, there are a whole lot of a host of reasons. I've listed some of them on the slides, if you see. 
one thing which is common in, in India is that the officially recorded transaction price is often a fraction of what the actual price was because as of the stamp duties, uh, uh, you know, official reporting is, is much lower. So a lot of the uh, transaction is in black money. Uh, so that's a problem. Uh, simple uh, economics 101 tells us that if uh, some car factory or some railway station is being built in some rural region, uh, first of all, there's a supply shock to the land market there, right? You're taking off a ch chunk of land, and basic demand supply tells us that they should drive up the price. Uh, also, when an industrial or some sort of valuable activity come moves in, some, some sort of, you know, uh, uh, take again as example the car factory in Singur, surely it will spawn other industries, there will be sort of auxiliary industries uh, trying to move in and try to buy land in the same region around the factory, and this is going to place a uh, severe demand pressure on the price of land in the region. Right? So uh, it can safely be expected that once a pro people come to know that you know, this sort of project will move in, past prices would become a very poor guide to even what contemporary prices are uh, right on the ground today after the project is announced. Uh, so, so that it was, the, I think, the principal flaw uh, of the 1894 Act, that it was backward looking, it, uh, it pegged compensation to uh, prices, market prices, looking backwards, whereas what was necessary was to, to peg it to prices uh, looking forward, or at least looking uh, at this point in time. Uh, the last point is also worth stressing a little bit, so I'll, I'll mention it. Uh, uh, in addition to all of this, uh, land markets in India, it's well known to development economic economists, is land markets in India is, are very uh, imperfect. Uh, the volume of, of land transactions uh, are, are uh, 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 very minimal. It's uh, very difficult to get uh, price uh, data. Um, so presumably there's a lot of frictions in the land market, especially because credit markets are also imperfect, so it's not easy for people to get put together to money to, to buy a, a chunk of land. Uh, so when land markets uh, are, are imperfect and there are all kinds of frictions, even if people get a lot of monetary compensation, it may not be always possible to, to buy up the kind of land that they had in, in you know, neighboring regions. Um, so here's what we think are the, is basically wrong with the 2013 Act. Uh, we don't think it's, it's to do with uh, what is now the bone of contention so much. I mean, uh, the consent requirement and the um, uh, uh, and the social impact assessment. What is wrong has it, it? The core of the problem is how the compensation amount is determined. Uh, in the current legislation, it's still arbitrary. It's much more generous than what it used to be because it's being multiplied uh, several times. But it's still arbitrary and ad hoc, and there's no sort of good reason why it should be that, that amount. The other big problem, I think, is, is that the entire process, especially determination of compensation, is totally top-down. So the people affected have no say whatsoever in, uh, in, in determining it. So they may, it may lead to unhappiness, but even if it doesn't actually lead to unhappiness, it, it provides uh, a rhetorical instrument to, to uh, people who are affected that uh, you know, we uh, have been done, done in. Uh, and uh, I guess the lawmakers had some sense that, that they're basically throwing stones in the dark and there's no guarantee that it'll hit the mark and make everyone happy. So that may be one of the reasons why they threw the kitchen sink at it and created these additional layers, uh, like social impact assessment, for example, which people have argued with some justification that those kinds of things often can lead to delays or corruption because it's an opaque process where uh, some people will uh, just apply discretion or judgment whether a pro uh, project can be passed or not. So what we suggested, Moitrish and I, in our EPW article in 2011 is to take a completely different approach, uh, especially to this issue of you know, how much compensation should be paid. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, try to describe to you what this, uh, uh, what this other method is, and then I'll try to uh, sort of explain what we think are its major advantages. Uh, 
So what we are saying, and we are drawing upon sort of, you know, very standard economic theory in, in microeconomics auction theory uh, to sort of uh, formulate the core of our argument. And I'll briefly mention that. So, so here's what could have been done. Uh, so the government, the problem, what, what makes the problem very uh, difficult is the contiguity requirement, right? If for some reason government wanted 1,000 acres of land around Patna, right? They could be spat, scattered all over. That, that would be very easy. Just, just go around, hold an auction, buy it from whoever wants to sell, uh, and, and uh, acquired plots could be spread out like a polka dot uh, t-shirt. Uh, the problem is to build a factory or anything else, these land pieces have to be adjacent to e each other, and they have to form a contiguous area, and that's what uh, makes it uh, difficult. So what we are saying is for the moment, you know, to begin with, forget about the contiguity requirement and let there be an, uh, a procurement auction for land in, where in, you know, in the villages where uh, uh, the project is to be situated and anybody can sell. So hold an auction both in the proposed project site as well as around it. Uh, all the landowners there have to submit some asking price for the land and the government should buy the cheapest plots. Now, some of the land ultimately needed for the project will come up through this auction, but not all of it will. So there will be uh, unacquired uh, plots sitting there in the place where the factory is to be built. Uh, now, this is the sort of last step. There could be land swaps. So people who haven't sold, uh, who are sitting on the project site, who haven't sold in the auction, they can be given alternative uh, tracts or plots in a region surrounding uh, the, the project site, and they can be basically sort of moved a little distance, uh, but still hold on to land. And this sort of auction will determine both the amount and form of compensation, right? Ultimately, uh, how much cash compensation is given to land losers that will come up through the auction that we're proposing and uh, some of the farmers who, who uh, ask for very high prices for their land, they may be compensated not in land but in other plots of land. So I'll give you a sort of a Mickey Mouse version of what we are saying in, in a sort of an animated uh, picture. So suppose this is the project site and there are these uh, 16 plots of land Right? This is highly sort of stylized and abstract, but just to convey the general idea. Uh, suppose these 16 plots of land have to be acquired to build some, some high value project. Uh, so what we're saying is uh, hold an auction over a bigger area, right? including these, these uh, white plots uh, all around. And buy the cheapest 16 plots in this sort of bigger uh, perimeter. So once the auction is over, this is one sort of you know, uh, illustrative example. The black squares are the plots, suppose, that have been bought in the auction, right? So some of them are in the project site already, uh, but some of them are, are, are outside. The government ultimately wouldn't need those, those ones in the periphery. Uh, but the gov there are also sort of these gray plots in there which haven't yet been purchased, right? Th those sellers, those landowners were asking too high a price, so they didn't end up being the sellers in the auction. So now what can be done is these people sitting in these gray plots, they can be one by one moved to uh, plots outside that have, that have been purchased. So like this, this, and this, okay? So then ultimately the, you have a consolidated of the holdings where uh, the project can now uh, go ahead. So what are the advantages of doing it this way? So this, this I think is the main advantages. Uh, one big thing is participation. Uh, the current uh, sort of system is not just, you know, of course, eminent domain is always going to be coercive, but there are degrees of coerciveness. So if we can reduce the degree of coercion, that, of course, improves matters and, and, and could, could lower discontent. So at least if you let people participate in forming the compensation amount that is, that is being paid for the land, uh, that certainly, uh, that can only things make things better. The thing with participation is of course that uh, somehow um, the price that sellers ask for has to be credible, right? If you just go and ask people, you know, how much money do you need for your land, they might quote the moon. 
So the, what, what keeps sellers honest in general as an economics principle is competition. So uh, if you can make the owners of land who are sitting on the project site com compete with their neighbors who are outside, right? that can sort of generate some amount of honest bids and honest uh, uh, revelation of, of value, and, and that is the key to, to sort of you know, bring out values, uh, personal values of land uh, through an auction process. Um, the other advantage uh, is that uh, it can, to some extent, proxy for the missing land markets and the transactions which should have happened uh, but doesn't happen because the land market is not perfect is, can be proxied through, through this sort of an auction process. Uh, and the most major thing, I think, is, is transparency. Uh, it reduces uh, bureaucratic uh, discretion and uh, sort of makes the process much more uh, transparent. Auctions are very popular uh, these days, of late. You know, after all the scandals and the scams, we, we now say everybody practically agrees that uh, coal block allocations or spectrum or, you know, gi giving uh, public resources to private companies should be done through uh, some rule-bound process like auction rather than uh, dependent on the discretionary powers of decision makers because that's a recipe for corruption. So, so one way to sort of pitch what we're saying is to say that, well, why not extend those same principles to, to land acquisition too? Uh, just a quick theoretical note uh, for those of you who, who want to know, you know, what precisely is the theoretical thinking. Well, if you make a few, uh, what we are proposing is essentially a multi-unit victory auction, right? So if 100 plots of land have to be acquired, the auction price should be the 101st uh, uh, lowest bid. Uh, that's where the price ought to be pegged. Uh, under certain assumptions, this theoretically would be the sort of best mechanism that you can create. Best in what sense? Best in the sense that it respects participation constraints of, of landowners and it uh, minimizes the acquisition costs for the government. Uh, but of course, you have to make certain uh, strong assumptions. For example, you have to assume that you know, the various plots of land are perfect substitutes. Of course, what can happen in reality is that you take away fertile, irrigated land from someone and give as a replacement a uh, plot of land which is kind of arid and dry and not irrigated. So that, of course, won't work. Uh, but as a first pass, if you make certain you know, strong assumptions, you can show that uh, this sort of auction is actually theoretically uh, the best thing. Uh, in reality, there will be uh, limitations arising from the fact that uh, land quality will uh, is often heterogeneous. Uh, uh, there are relocation costs. Uh, there are potentially externalities generated by by the project itself. For example, if you know the, it uh, lowers the water level, then that could reduce uh, farm productivity and so on, or collusion among bidders. Uh, now, what? Of course, we don't mean is that uh, the, the auction is a cure-all method of, of solving this sort of problem. Currently, what's happening is that you know uh, the main sort of what lies at the center of the problem, uh, the compensation amount, is determined entirely ad hoc, right? The entire estimation of value is is determined by some mechanical formula, four times the the past uh, market price. What an auction can bring out is, is uh, the most important component of value for, for land losers, but there will be other potential uh, sort of costs arising from, for example, relocation costs. If the new plot of land is further away, that might increase costs of farming it, and so on. So, you know, one can kind of flesh out, uh, so, so what I'm, I'm laying down is a core idea, one, one has to build on that. So, in addition to the auction price, uh, some other ad hoc payments have to be may have to be added. Uh, that's also true currently, actually, of the legislation. Often, what happens is that there's standing crops on the plot of land, or some well, or something which has been dug, which then has to be whose value has to be estimated. So, so all these add-ons have to be have to be there. But the main sort of uh, value of of what is being taken away, if it's uh, determined through an auction process. I think, I think it has the advantages that, that I talked about. Um, let me skip uh, this. Um, 
So I, I will be wrapping up. Uh, one aspect of this, which uh, people have talked about, you know, this sort of auction determined compensation method uh, applies to, to owners, of course. Uh, some people who are affected are not necessarily owners, not necessarily people who have uh, property rights on the, on the assets being taken. So, for example, tenants or uh, landless laborers and so on and so forth. Um, so one, one big issue which comes up is that uh, uh, how should uh, uh, these people be compensated? And, and on that, we have less to say. I think we, that is a major problem. Uh, um, one thing should, which should be pointed out is that uh, in, in thinking about land acquisition, often sort of market-based reasoning is not applied. Market-based reasoning in the sense, not in the normative sense, but in the sense of you know, trying to positively understand what the market impact of acquisition is, is going to be. So let me just mention one point in that context. Uh, the current legislation says that uh, people who are working on that piece of land as tenants or, or uh, workers have to be identified and they have to be paid certain uh, amounts of compensation. Uh, the problem is through the market, the uh, effect of acquisition is, is going to spread to other tenants and other laborers. It's everybody in the local agricultural markets will be affected. So for example, if the total farm area shrinks, that's surely going to drive up uh, rents and so have a negative impact on the welfare of all tenants. Similarly, if there's less land to cultivate, it's going to drive down local wages, right? So there's going to be spillover effects on, on other economic a a actors effect, uh, other than landowners, and which do the legislation doesn't seem to be sort of cognizant of that. Uh, so the strategy is, <coughs> I don't have some, anything very specific to suggest here, but uh, I think the, the way to ease the pain for uh, other quote unquote stakeholders have to, I mean, the approach has to be much more broad-based than just identifying a smaller group of people and, and throwing some compensation at them. Um, okay, so that's about uh, as much time I had. So I'll wrap up with, with that one. Thank you. Um, first, I would like to thank uh, IGC and uh, Bihar, uh, part of it, more so. Uh, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you for creating this opportunity of getting together um, this platform to interact with practitioners, academicians, as well as policymakers. This is a very good opportunity where all these people can come together and discuss these ideas. Um, I have been working on, our organization has been working on the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. And uh, we've been following it up for more than a decade now. All these years we've been seeing that though there is allocation uh, to the tune of 40,000 crores around every year, we see that um, every state, most of the states do not utilize the funds that are allocated to them. They present labor budgets every year, but the budgets remain underutilized. Why is this? The, the basic core of the program says that you have to demand work and then you'll get work. But is that so? Is that the real constraint that there is not much demand and hence the um, funds are remaining underutilized? This is something that really uh, intrigued me more so because Andhra Pradesh, which is the neighboring state of Maharashtra from where I come from, uh, was, spend, was utilizing much more funds, was reaching out much more than Maharashtra, and uh, this, this paradox really uh, uh, got me interested in the whole process of how NREGA is getting implemented in both these states. So this is something that I tried to learn by visiting all these places in Maharashtra as well as Andhra Pradesh, and uh, I'm trying to put forward whatever lessons I have learned in this uh, journey. We all know, we are quite familiar with NRAJ, it's almost 10 years now. It's guarantee, it's, it just says two important things. One, 
Work has to be started within 15 days and payments have to be done in 15 days. Though we keep talking about wage, here the, the program is, has dual intentions, has dual objectives. It is not just wage employment, but it is also supposed to create good quality works which can help uh, silent water conservation type of work which can help the small and marginal farmers in their farm productivity. Um, it, now, this program has uh, been initiated, though initiated in 2005, it, it's only in 2008 that it has spread across all over India. Um, like I said, giving payment within 15 days and providing work within 15 days on demand is the most crucial aspect. More so because the payment is, though announced as daily wage, is not actually daily wage. It is a piece rate based payment, which means that every payment has to be calculated based on the work done by the group of laborers or the laborer uh, herself. Now given this, it requires a lot of work by different agencies to calculate the work done every week and make those payments happen every fortnight. Now for this, lot of implementation design is required, which is unlike the other rural development programs. For example, if we take Indira Avas Yojana, it is a simple vertical line implementation design where it is easier, once you have identified the beneficiary, it is easier to implement something like Indira Avas Yojana. But for NREJ, it's more cyclical, it's more complex, so it requires a lot of coordinated effort of different agencies. Um, it's demand driven and it, um, there are two important things here. One is unemployment allowance. So if you are not given work within 15 days, state governments are, uh, are liable to give some kind of an unemployment allowance, which is 25% of the notified wage. And also, if the wage payments are being, give, are being delayed, that with the, if it is not given within 15 days, then some kind of a compensation also has to be given uh, to each laborer for each wage payment. Now, given all these aspects, we can realize that the uh, implementation mechanism has to be really geared up to tackle all these issues. Uh, there are also transparency and accountability measures in NREJ which no other government program has shown up till now and which is in the form of its website and gives a lot of data uh, which, is not, not, which is not too old data though not real time data. But uh, again that means that your work has to be immediately uploaded, all your musters have to be immediately uploaded so that you and all, you and I in addition to all the bureaucracy, get to know what is happening at the ground level. If we see the reach till now, now given that this is the implementation mechanism and these are the implementation related aspects that need to be taken into consideration, let's look at the coverage. Coverage is like we have reached out to more than one third of the villages of ac across India. We look at the percentage generated and look at the total expenditure. It is, these numbers are mind boggling. Now to, to, to make this happen, the implementation mechanism becomes the most important and the crucial aspect in the whole process. And when we see, this is from a ESID briefing paper, which says that if you look at the poverty, uh, magnitude of poverty across states, and if we look at the um, NREGA performance, it doesn't match. The more the poverty in a particular state, we would say that the need is more. And if the need is more, the performance or the expenditure or the number of houses that uh, NREJ could reach out to has to be higher in those states where poverty is higher. But that doesn't seem to be happening. Now this is a puzzle. If we look at across states, we see that um, some states like Andhra Pradesh have done much better than say Bihar or Jharkhand. Why is that so? Now we can see that some states have consistently done better than uh, other states. And uh, over a period of five, six years, if uh, we try to aggregate, we realize that there are five or six states which take up 50 to 60% of the total expenditure in a particular year from NREGM. 
Why is that so? Given 29, 30 sta 29 states and given the poverty in other states, uh, one would expect that the poorer state need to utilize more of NREJ funds. We, the, this study that these two graphs have come from also state that there is a marked variation in the provision of employment. Our employment outcomes are lower in the states where there are higher poverty levels. And this is, though the program is demand based, there are supply constraints which seem to be blocking the way uh, uh, poorer states would perform. And what are those supply constraints? What has that got to do with the state capacity to respond to the demand from the poorer families? That's where I'm trying to go. There are quite a few challenges in implementation, given the complex implementation. Um, it is, NREJ has not reached its scope or potential that it, that it can. Wage payments, even today, are not being paid on time. More than 50% of the times, wage payments are delayed. Projects that are taken up are more on ad hoc basis, not much planning is going into it. And there's a lot of, um, if, you, if you look at all the newspapers, it's more to do with corruption scams in NREJ rather than the kind of projects that are being taken up and how, pe how it is helping people to get out of poverty. There's more related to scams than the other things. Now, given all this, administration is under severe stress and um, Hence, implementation at the local level becomes much more important. What we tried to do was study Andhra Pradesh and Maharashtra and try to understand how NREJ is being implemented at the cutting edge level. At the block level, at the mandal level, what is it that is happening that makes Andhra Pradesh do much better than Maharashtra? If we look at the employment provided in terms of households, Andhra Pradesh over the years between 2008 till date has consistently done much better than Maharashtra. Whereas Maharashtra has had NREJ as in, in the form of employment guarantee scheme for last three decades, much before uh, the national rural employment. So Maharashtra was experienced in implementing NREJ or the erstwhile EGS, yet it did not pick up when NREJ came into existence. Why is that so? If we look at the expenditure across years, again, Andhra Pradesh obviously has spent much more, has utilized much more central government funds than Maharashtra did. But we do find some change over the years later. Let us try and understand what happened. And this is all the more important in the context that if we look at the poverty level in Maharashtra, it is more than double than Andhra Pradesh. There are just 10% of the people, rural uh, population in um, Andhra Pradesh, which is below poverty line, whereas Maharashtra says 24%. Given this, Maharashtra should have been spending more, should have been reaching out to more households than Andhra Pradesh. But we realized that implementation related issues were uh, much more smoothened out, much more uh, cleared out in Andhra Pradesh than in Maharashtra around this period. I started looking at it around 2008, 9, 9, 10, and with frequent visits to villages, talking to people in villages, as well as all the functionaries who are involved in the implementation of the program, both in Andhra Pradesh and Maharashtra. What we realized that uh, one basic change in Andhra Pradesh and Maharashtra is um, Andhra Pradesh has Mandal as the basic unit of administration at which is the sub-district level, which is much smaller than the block in uh, uh, Maharashtra, uh, which is the sub-district sub administration level in Maharashtra. So this Mandal and block is uh, something which is structurally different in Andhra Pradesh and uh, Maharashtra. Uh, what Andhra Pradesh did was it hired a lot of people on contract other than the regular employees in their uh, panchayat uh, office, in their block office, in their bundle office, exclusively for NREJ implementation. So there were uh, people uh, under the block officer, there were technical officers under the junior engineer who were looking after NREJ exclusively. There were people at the village level, like the field assistant 
who later was named as Gram Rozgar Sevak, and uh, a technical assistant at the panchayat level. All these people were on contract, and all these were hired exclusively for NREG. So a very good HR boost was given by Andhra Pradesh right at the beginning. Not just hiring, but a continuous training program for them has been designed and since then has been executed very meticulously. The manuals, all the program that is given to them. This is very important to understand the role clarity that each of that individual who is working there has got. Because if you go and talk to any field assistant or technical assistant or the assistant to APO, they know their role very well. They know if they don't do their job today, how that will affect the person who is supposed to take up that job tomorrow. It has to go from one person to another. And that, that role clarity is very, very well ingrained. All the manuals, all the books that are given to them, uh, give them understanding of their own tasks. I, at each, at, at a very minutest level. Then, um, the, for the payment purpose, the last mile connectivity was a big problem. 2008, um, Minister of Rural Development announced that all payments should be made through post offices or banks. And then Andhra Pradesh uh, took it up uh, to, for the last mile connectivity to go from post office. Post offices were quite into the villages, but the banks were not so. Banks were further away. So they, they, the, the self-help group was given the responsibility to do the last mile connectivity, that the, that the money from the banks can come into the self-help groups and disburse to the wage seekers through self-help groups. They were called the customer service providers. So many such small and big pilots were taken up by Andhra Pradesh to understand how they can overcome the bottlenecks and uh, speed up and also make the implementation effective. There were a lot of feedback mechanism built into the whole system, which was in terms of uh, getting complaints through helplines, phone lines, uh, toll-free phone lines. There were the sessions with the commissioner directly on uh, TV where you can call in and uh, give complaints. So there several different methods were employed to understand what's the problem at the ground level so as to fix it. So the feedback loop was also very strongly built in. The MIS that we see, the NREG uh, website that we see is been designed by NIC, but it's only in Andhra Pradesh that it is designed by TCS and then it is merged with uh, NIC. So it's almost a real time MIS that Andhra Pradesh is using right now, which gives them um, uh, which gives them much more leverage in correcting on time. All the uh, taking up correcting measures also becomes much more easier and effective. Now compare this with Maharashtra at that time. Uh, we had much bigger blocks. Uh, there was no new recruitment for Im implementation of NREGA. Uh, there were a lot of overlapping roles because the earlier EGS was run through revenue department and now it was being run through the Panchayati Raj. And so there was a lot of overlap and leading to a lot of confusion. Um, MIS was not updated for months together. There was no feedback mechanism. There was no place to give complaints by the uh, laborers. So there was virtually no gear up to move from EGS to NREJ and handle the new implementation method that was being, um, that was being taken up by other states for NREJ. Then around 2010-11, uh, government of Maharashtra really started thinking about this and started gearing up to bring in the changes. It brought in a lot of changes in two years. Like basically the operational uh, clarity was brought in. Lot of government orders were issued to understand the roles and uh, clarity of everybody working at uh, different levels of implementation. New recruitments, especially at the block level and the Gram Panchayat level were done. One difference was especially related to Gram Rozgar Sevak. I'll come to that. Um, most of the sanctioning was at the district level. So all blocks, like let us say Nashik district, has 15 blocks. So all 15 blocks had to approach district for every small sanctioning of either the project or the work or the work order. All that changed and everything moved to the block level and the GP level. So decision making became simpler and became faster. 
um, computer centers were set up at the block level. All, all the changes which were required to be done much earlier, which were not done, were understood, uh, realized, and were brought in. And for this, uh, though Government of India allows only 6% of the total expenditure for administrative expenses, Government of Maharashtra went ahead and said, we are ready to spend 9%, more rest out of 3% out of our kitty, so that we can bring in all these changes. Uh, with electronic fund management system, moving on to banks, lot of streamlining of fund management, fund flow from state to block to GP was made uh, easier because of the fund management system. Uh, the Gram Rozgar Sevak appointments, we learned from other uh, states that the field assessments or the Gram Rozgar Sevaks were given fixed remuneration per month. Whereas, uh, that also meant that that was a big expenditure on the state uh, administrative expenses because not all villages require uh, NREJ. And that means villages where no NREJ ever happens, especially in the irrigated belt, also have to pay their field assistance or the Gram Rozgar Sevak per month. Learning from this, Maharashtra government decided to move on to a compensation package that whenever some work happens, so whatever percentage get, des, get generated in a particular Gram Panchayat, based on that, a compensation will be given to Gram Rozgar Sevak. This also reduces the burden on the uh, administrative expenses. So learning from other states, taking from other states, government of Maharashtra brought in a lot of changes over a period of two to two and a half years. Uh, a lot of new uh, rules and procedures were brought in, especially related to unemployment allowance and delayed compensation. Delayed compensation is now pegged into the system itself. So if the date on in the computer system shows that the payment is getting delayed, automatically compensation is calculated and the uh, laborers get uh, their wage payment plus the compensation that is due to them. Transparency with each gram panchayat getting a kind of a wall painting. In, they introduce pay slips per week, which is not yet uh, really stabilized, but these kind of things have been brought in. An exclusive website of Maharashtra government, which gives all the circulars, all the government orders, everything about NREJ on this website, which is available to all of us. So this kind of transparency and some kind of grievance redressal mechanism through a district level ombudsman, through a helpline, which is again a toll free helpline, and social audit directorate has been brought in. After doing all this, after having a series of, no, it's not, not, not just that the, there is a secretariat sitting in Bombay and giving away just papers saying these things need to be changed. There were, series of meetings across Maharashtra with all levels of administrators, block levels, district levels, technical officers, with Gram Rozgar Sevaks, uh, all the training design was prepared and trainings were rolled out. After all this of two years of efforts, we can see that between 10, 11 and 11, 12, we see a jump in the coverage of uh, NREJ reaching out to more and more households and more percentage getting generated in Maharashtra from 2011-12. Households who were getting work also increased between 10, 11, and 11, 12. And when we see this, um, a, we have seen this from very close quarters. We've seen each change coming in. Simple things like forms and registers which were maintained at block level and gram panchayat level. Uh, were varied. Each block came out with their own way of uh, putting their data together, uh, monitoring their projects. So it was all very, dif very different. But then came and we had a committee which sat through all this paperwork and created a set of forms which are now uniform across Maharashtra for each block so that all the data that gets generated and collected can be understood and seen and retrieved at a standardized level at, uh, at the state level, which helps the state administration to understand what's happening at the ground level. Given all this, uh, we realized that uh, though we're talking about policy, it's, it's the pain after the policy is framed, uh, even if there are guidelines given, it's after that the implementation mechanism and the nuts and bolts of that 
uh, which are very important to understand the performance of any uh, particular program in a state. If you look at Andhra Pradesh and Bihar, again, Bihar has three times more rural poverty than Andhra Pradesh. And yet, Andhra Pradesh is spending much more on NREJ than Bihar. Obviously, Bihar needs to spend much more on NREJ than Andhra Pradesh and can get more central government funds for this. It doesn't need to spend out of its kitty. It is central government fund which can be brought in to for rural development. Um, from, from this journey, what I have learned is that though the program design and the guidelines, and I was even part of the revised guidelines that was formed by the MORD, at the state level, interpretation of those guidelines and the capacity to implement those guidelines, finding right people, finding people who can work with computers, who can fix up computers at the block level in the tribal areas is not so easy. And uh, those state, uh, since the state governments are responsible for implementation, lot of, a lot of innovations need to go into how these things can be done at the block level, at the cutting edge level. And um, we can see that Andhra Pradesh could do so well for several reasons. And one of them was the political milieu which helped them, and also the entire uh, gamut of administrative uh, setup that, that they built in for NREJ. Maharashtra did not have either. Uh, in tomorrow's um, uh, talk by Patrick, he will tell you about uh, Maharashtra's clientelism and how NREJ is just not being allowed to be implemented by the, by the one set of farmers in uh, Maharashtra. So given this situation, Maharashtra could change its NREJ implementation because of some uh, administrative reforms. So even this is um, equally important and to understand performance of any program, uh, we feel at, who work at the block level to understand how block can respond, how block functionaries can respond to the changes that are being suggested at the policy level. Thank you. Ms. Kulkarni, I could not have agreed more with your findings. As I was also a joint secretary of rural development in government of India. During its expansion from phase one of MG Narega to phase two, I was joint secretary PMGSY. So I have seen how the best of the designs of MG Narega were made in GUI and how those of us who are working in administration knows the devil lies in administrative detail the best of policy intentions fall on the altar of execution. And this was our experience at the Government of India Ministry of Rural Development level, that the states where there is a better machinery of implementation at the sub-district level. But she has said Mandal. Mandal is around 15,000 uh, population in uh, Andhra Pradesh, around three panchayats as compared to uh, Maharashtra, which has got 50 or 60,000 uh, population. In Bihar, we have got average 70,000 population. That Monday level officer is a uh, civil servant selected by the state civil service commission, the Mandal development officer. And the one more um, information on the administrative detail side, why uh, MG Narega, uh, the Andhra Pradesh, are the best performing state? Because the uh, administrative leadership there the principal secretary of rural development, K. Raju, was there for continuously seven years as principal secretary of rural development. So because Raju was there for continuously seven years, he could provide a continuity of administrative leadership backed by, of course, the political uh, support. Because at that time, the state government and the central government, both in Andhra and the government of India, were the same. So political uh, milieu, as you have pointed out, the administrative leadership at the state level and the sub-district implementation machinery, these are the uh, key findings of your uh, finding, which I am, again, uh, supporting or endorsing uh, the, uh, the uh, execution, um, the better implementation design for policy effectiveness. So now the uh, floor is open uh, for any question for both speakers, both on the issue of land acquisition and second on the MG Narega or its design and implementation.
on principle that different sellers will get different prices, right? Uh, no, I should have explained that better. They will, they will get a common price. The price will, it, it's like a second price auction uh, extended to multiple units. So if there are 50 units, let's say, to be taken, and uh, so you, you uh, get these bids from the various owners, uh, so the common selling price will be the 51st uh, lowest bid. Lowest 50 people will, uh, their land will be acquired at that 51st bid. So some of them get more than what they asked for. Uh, the last person gets approximately more or less what he or she asked for. Right, the second question is, I mean, once an auction has been announced, is the state obliged to buy the land it had set, it set out to buy? Okay, so, so um, I, I guess you're thinking that, you know, what, what if the, the, I mean, there should be some sort of upper limit uh, to, to the price, acquisition price. So li like with uh, any auction, you, uh, one could throw in a sort of a reserve price that if, if the auction price uh, exceeds this, then uh, uh, the project has to be cancelled. Um, so, you know, the, the decision of whether to convert some piece of farmland into industry, that should also be part of the, part of the design. Um, it shouldn't be an automatic presumption. That's another sort of example of a kind of a top-down approach that, that uh, uh, people higher up decide that, you know, this, uh, it's, it's good to build a car factory here. So whoever wants to acquire it for whatever reason, whether it be government or whether it be private sector, has to ultimately bid for it. And they can submit their own maximum price that we don't want to go about that. Okay, but, it, but in a way, this does not therefore obviate the problem of the government fixing that maximum price. I mean, in the earlier formula, it was four times the market price. It was two times. Now, the, the state will have to fix an upper limit, which could promote the possibility of uh, uh, collusion, right? I mean, among, especially since you're talking about contiguous plots. So it's, it's entirely conceivable that farmers can get together and say that uh, that they will settle only for the highest permissible price. So that effectively, the problem reduces to the fixing of an acceptable highest price. Failing yeah. that, of course, I mean, there could be a race to the bottom. You know. Uh, Yes, I, I totally agree. I mean, collusion, uh, so it, it depends on what you then think is the empiric empirically the possibility of collusion in, in these sorts of, sorts of problems. If, you, uh, if there's perfect collusion, then uh, essentially uh, uh, it, it, it comes down to the state essentially stating a price, except that uh, farmers collectively still have a choice. <coughs> I mean, right now the default is the state quotes the price and farmers cannot even refuse it. So at least the collective right of refusal will be built in, but any advantage of extracting values or uh, lowering the sort of budgetary uh, burden on the government by generating competition among the farmers as, as sellers, uh, that advantage will, will certainly go away. Is it prudent to have a pan-Indian policy for uh, purchase of land? Because you see, in the Gangetic belt, where the land uh, fertility is very high, there the strategy will be different than the arid places. So I think one has to work out a different strategy based on the productivity of the land. I just wanted to have this. Yeah. See, s quite a bit of flexibility is, is built into what we are proposing. Actually, some amount of flexibility is built into even the two times, four times formula, because if you go from the fertile plains to some arid, rocky regions, then the market price will be lower, and therefore four times the market price will also be lower. So in that sense, there is uh, flexibility in, in both uh, what, what we are uh, proposing and uh, the sort of current default. Uh, I guess what you may have in mind is that uh, the, even the processes may, may have to be very different, quite apart from the outcome. Uh, that is, uh, see, uh, sure, so let me kind of take a slightly different track than, than what you suggested. Uh, uh, 
this kind of auction based method of evaluating land as an asset works as long as you can generate competition as long as you know uh, it's it's a substitutable asset uh, in very large scale acquisition like the Narmada project for example where people's entire communities are busted up right so so what is being taken doesn't really have uh, replacement uh, so so in those sorts of problems i think the approach has to be very different and and this kind of you know uh, uh, how do we determine through an auction the value of of a community which is which is now going to be disrupted and people are going to be scattered uh, in, in you know and cultural destruction and environmental destruction and so on and so forth so so what we have in mind is uh, uh, to be more explicit, uh, I, I think it works much better for uh, uh, smaller projects like the Singur and the Nandigram or even maybe the you know uh, Delhi Noida Highway kind of example, but should not. Uh, I mean, it's it's a very different kind of problem when we when we have something like Narmada. Um, and uh, the other sort of general issue which arises from your question, I think, is uh, a general problem. I don't have a very firm view on that. I mean, there has to be some structure nationally that, you know, it, it, to, to sort of ask all states to, to devise their land acquisition policy from scratch, uh, maybe to too much decentralization. Um, but I think it's a serious question to what extent you want to legislate the, the whole process down to the last detail and to what extent you want to leave room for administrative innovation. So what we're talking of is a, is a broad guideline. I think there's, you know, even if that is adopted, there is room for sort of experimentation or local variation or administrative discretion on, on sort of particular aspects of, of implementing that. Ashwini, thanks for a very interesting presentation. I just wanted to uh, provoke you a little further. Um, I agree with a lot of what you said about Andhra Pradesh and, and the kind of investment they made. I was I uh, spent a lot of time studying the social audit and evolution of NREGA there. But I wonder if, um, in some ways, Andhra Pradesh also took the easy way, easy route out in the sense that its investments were entirely in its bureaucracy and not in its panchayats. And in the long term, I think that seriously in, uh, has affected the effectiveness of much of its accountability measures in terms of its ability to actually change the dynamics of politics at the local level. So um, how um, patient or impatient should we be with this question of implementation capacity is one question. And related to that, um, a, lot, a lot of what you set up uh, earlier and some of this, the work that's come out more recently um, on Bihar, for example, which tells us that in many ways, um, the accountability efforts in NREGA expanded the um, sort of try to try to make the way the local system operates far far more tight and therefore expanded the quantum of work that was supposed to be done which made it much harder even to do some of the basics um, and it, it's a cash 22 kind of question I'm a great fan of a lot of the accountability measures and I believe that they are very important but it also has some counter implications on the ability of the system, especially broken systems in poorer states, which we know don't implement NREGA very well. Um, so how does one begin to think of getting out of that trap, and where does one go? I do agree with you, Yamini, but there are a couple of things that, especially when you compare Andhra Pradesh and Maharashtra, we realize that Maharashtra things don't, uh, things don't go ahead simply because of the the value at the even at the village level I mean works are not started because there are some people around there who do not want it to get started now Andhra Pradesh in some sense could overcome this by be, being top-down by being bureaucratic in some this is a big criticism on Andhra Pradesh that there is no role for Panchayati Raj in the whole system maybe they sit for the meetings Sarpanch are called and they I mean the head council has uh, undergoes training and meetings and all that but like Rajasthan is involved in the implementation even payments but Andhra Pradesh never gave that role to Panchayati system. so I think it's now we can s sit back and it's been eight nine years we can think whether it has helped the the really needy in Andhra Pradesh to 
access work because uh, the rural elite were not involved. Well, maybe it was not by design, but did it help? Maybe we can look into this. I mean, uh, I mean, I have been through the the question that you have put forward, and what this is the only thing that gives me peace that maybe this is because of this the rural elite could not capture NREJ, which has happened in other places, and uh, it is true that um, see it's it's the other catch twenty two situation is that there's too much of talk about corruption related to welfare schemes, not just NREJ, all schemes. But if you look at really the magnitude, it's not so great in, in sense of proportion. If we look at all the infrastructure projects that get done all over India, I mean, we don't even know what is the magnitude in those uh, places. But what is happening is that because of that, we keep trying to tighten something or the other, and then the local bureaucracy finds it all the more difficult to implement the whole uh, processes. This is very true. But so personally, if we want to talk about corruption in uh, uh, NREJ, I would say let's talk about the missing days rather than the missing wages. The average per household, though entitlement is 100, has never gone beyond 55. So where are those 45 days which were meant for the household, which has never reached the household? That's more important an issue than the whatever four, five, seven days of corruption that has happened across India. questions if uh, there are no other questions we can uh, thank both the uh, presenters for their thought provoking ideas both on the auction based compensation as an experiment for land acquisition and the uh, administrative uh, model for uh, successful implementation of a rights based program thank you very much thank you. desire or will you just give them a job uh, and there are no answers to be 